So once again, I am the moderator for today, and I want to sort of set out three, three goals here. One is to introduce the speakers and the topics. Two is to help moderate a lively conversation, and we will certainly have a lively conversation. Yesterday was a great indicator of that. And three, of course, and the hardest part of the job is to keep on schedule. I'm sure all of us would have liked more time with the minister. We didn't have it. We have uh, at panel after panel packed with absolutely outstanding insight and great global leaders. So I ask everyone in asking questions to make sure that the questions end with a question mark and are not commentary. Um, I also want to make an announcement. Probably many of you know this already. Uh, there is a session called the New Geography on Innovation that's moved to a new time slot. The new time slot is 3.55 today in Plenary B. So now my first task this morning is to introduce a session to discuss global risks. Obviously, we just heard about one important global challenge, global risk, and that is the energy market on which the global economy depends. In this uh, panel, we'll talk about all kinds of global risks, uh, monetary risks, geopolitical risks, social risks, and economic risks. And we have an outstanding panel of political and business leaders to join us in this discussion. So let me introduce them. Uh, as is the tradition here, the introductions will be in alphabetical order and the comments will be in alphabetical order. And in this panel, uh, each of the members of the panel will be coming to the podium to make a brief presentation before we engage in Q&A. So my panelists for the first session today are Mohammed al Jasser, the governor of the Saudi Arabian Monetary Agency, uh, Tony Blair, the former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Jean Chrétien, the former Prime Minister of Canada. Carolyn Daniels, the Chairman, CEO, and Founder of Aircraft Technical Publishers. Carlos Morea, who is the Founder and Chairman of WiseKey and a United Nations expert on inter information technology security. And James Turley, the Chairman and CEO of Ernst & Young. So, without further ado, given the talent we have uh, on the panel, uh, I will have uh, Mr. Al Jasser come and uh, give his comments. Hello. I believe you're the first speaker. Oh, wow. I'm very sorry. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين بداية بسبب المتحدثين ولغة الندوة التي نشترك فيها هي باللغة الإنجليزية فأعتذر عن أنني سوف أتحدث باللغة الإنجليزية لأن هذا ما طلب Good morning everyone I am honored to be again here with you at this uh, August uh, gathering. We in Riyadh are getting used to these uh, meetings and we are enjoying them. I hope our guests are also enjoying them and sharing the knowledge that we accumulate and we share together. Uh, I have few minutes I have been told to speak so I will uh, just highlight the points that I uh, would like to emphasize and maybe we can address them more afterwards in the Q&A session. First, uh, I would like to share also uh, uh, Minister An uh view on the global economy. I think the recovery is on track. Uh, we were worried about uh, the U.S. economy, for example. I think we are much more confident, as our colleagues in the, US, uh, in the U.S. also feel, that the recovery is on track, and therefore the rest of the global economy can relax a little bit. However, the recovery is fragile, sluggish, and uneven. 
And the unevenness is because in emerging economies, growth is much more robust than it is in the industrial countries as a whole. One of the things that worry us is, of course, inflation. And inflation uh, at this point in time is most probably influenced by the cost of food. As you know, climatic conditions and harvests have, been, have not been in the best of shape. At the same time, global demand for food is rising continuously. We also have heard from Minister Naimi the shifting uh, uh, of the global economy, the growth in the middle class, uh, the purchasing power in countries not with small populations, but with more than one-third of humanity, if you take China and India. So demand is growing very fast for food, while supply if anything, is being undermined by weather conditions and climatic changes. Basic economics, if demand is rising faster than supply, then prices would happen. And we have heard stories, particularly from India, where, where in one month, for example, the price of onions has quadrupled. I hope this is not going to be the, <laughs> the measure that we have to deal with. However, it's a sign uh, of uh, uh, concern. However, also, this country, under the leadership of King Abdullah, has uh, accelerated its investment in agricultural production beyond our borders. And therefore, the initiative, King Abdullah initiative, to invest in agricultural production in other countries, hopefully, will help. It's not going to solve all the problems, because this is a global problem. All of us have to be involved in it. For example, in India, my understanding is that about 30% of food perishes before it reaches the market. This is a huge economy with huge production capacity. So if we can spare some of that, then we can also help with, uh, with the, uh, food uh, inflation. And therefore, the infrastructure, the transportation, the supply uh, chain in India hopefully will be improved. The financial crisis, I would only like to highlight the following. If this traumatic experience of the global financial crisis were not to be in vain, we need to see some rebalancing between the major economies globally. And that rebalancing can be the silver lining, actually. Because if, for example, just for example, these are not the only two countries, but they are the largest economies now. If, for example, the U.S. were to be able to balance its economy, where there will be a bit less consumption over the medium to long term and more saving, where its financial sector would be rebalanced so it is much more prudent, better capitalized, and at the same time, if China were to rebalance domestically particularly, because there is an internal and there is an external rebalancing. If China were to rebalance its economy, where there would be much more domestic demand and consumption, then China will be better off for its own sake, while at the same time the rest of the global economy will be more balanced. The news that we have heard recently are encouraging. For example, retail sales in China have gone up by 18%. In real terms, that's about 14%. That's great. Of course, as they say, the devil is in the details. I have also heard that most of it is institutional or governmental consumption. But still, that's good. But I think personal income rebalancing in China needs to improve, and I think the Chinese are working very hard at that, and it should be uh, helpful. One warning, beware of, reduc of reductionism, not just in philosophy, but in economics. It would be a big mistake if we felt that if China were to revalue its currency by 10% or more or less, that that would be the panacea that everybody has been looking for. It will not. And if you don't believe me, flashback to the Plaza Accords. 
I see Prime Minister Blair and Prime Minister Chrétien looking at me because they remember. The Plaza Accord and the Louvre Accord in the 80s were supposed to solve the rebalancing or to help with the rebalancing between the U.S. and Japan. Toyotas continued to roll into California and New York, and the balance of payment didn't improve much. And partly because, not that there is no need for rebalancing, but the rebalancing is a much more complex economic problem than we can uh, blame it only on exchange rates. However, I think it would be a wonderful achievement if, for example, the Remimbi were to become internationalized. We need a multi-pronged currency system in the world. Better competition, and the Remimbi represents now the second largest economy. Of course, it may not be there yet. They don't have all the financial superstructure and infrastructure that can sustain such a role for the Remimbi. But I understand also that the Chinese have already started, actually. They, are sta they have started to do some of their trade with their neighbors and some mechanisms for settlement between the Remimbi and other currencies are happening. This is something I advise watching because this may be uh, one of the greatest achievements or maybe results of the financial crisis. It is my hope that all of us globally will be concentrating on the lesson learned from the financial crisis. And the most important lesson for me is that the three C's, I call them, counter-cyclicality in fiscal policy, counter-cyclicality in monetary policy, and counter-cyclicality in bank supervision or in financial supervision. We need all of that. And it doesn't matter if you're an emerging economy or an industrial economy. If, for example, the U.S. had acted counter-cyclically in its fiscal policy before the crisis, I think we would be discussing something different now. But when the crisis hit, there was not that wherewithal with which it can uh, solve the problems that have happened. Basel III, I think it's a great achievement. Only recently, a couple of weeks ago in Basel, 27 countries, including Saudi Arabia, we agreed on the, main, on, on, on the principles. And I think it will be a wonderful thing if also globally we all uh, do our best to achieve them. Light touch regulation is out because it was one of the culprits. Managerial and supervisory prudence are in. We always knew that, but somehow we lost them during <laughs> the years before the, before the crisis. Allowing bubbles to percolate continuously and uncontrollably is out also. And I think one of the elements in the new Basel Accord addresses that. And finally, macro prudential regulatory uh, uh, system is in. And we will be, all of us, well advised to take note of that and to uh, apply it. Finally, as I said, the three Cs, we have been applying them in Saudi Arabia all along. Sometimes we were even criticized for doing that because that's a bit conservative, that's a bit intrusive. Thank God we didn't listen to those who were advising that, and we listened to uh, others who have advised more prudence. And therefore, for example, Saudi Arabia is probably one of the very few countries in the world that we did not need at all, at all, to bail out financial institutions or even to go and try to clean up some of their portfolios, let's say the real estate portfolio or the industrial portfolio. We didn't need to do any of that because we acted counter-cyclically before the crisis hit, and I promise to keep it that way. Thank you very much.